So as I mentioned, uh, we're continuing our series in the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, then please turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 36. Thank you, uh, Masao, for having us read, read that passage. And this is a second part to the message on the, on the Sermon of Peter. And just by way of reminder that this was the first Christian sermon in church history. And that God certainly used this sermon to add 3,000 souls to the church. And what we will see in Peter's sermon may be something that we often hear in our culture. Uh, this sermon, this Peter here is being too preachy. Uh, what I mean by that is that his preaching is very dynamic, very powerful, and yet also very forceful. But all at the same time, it's very persuasive and very uh, reasonable. Now, Vody Bauckham, who is the Dean of Theology at African Christian University in Zambia, he once responded a question to this question, and that is, is preaching still relevant? Is preaching still relevant? And he said this regarding what our culture thinks about preaching. He said this, and I quote, it is God's authority that causes people to rebel. Don't preach to me. That's a phrase we hear in our culture. Don't be preachy. Our culture rebels against preaching. Instead of responding with the authority of God's word, what we have responded with is this approach to preaching that is not as preachy. Uh, if one generation wants to be less preachy, the next generation doesn't want to preach at all. He, there is no issue with the authority of God's word or the preacher's calling from God. The question arises is the faulty response to a culture that is in error, end quote. Now, I, I sympathize that sometimes there are preachers that can sound very preachy, and oftentimes the way I think about pre being preachy is uh, telling you what to do, uh, being very offensive, maybe even irritate some of you. But preachers shouldn't be preachy in the sense that they're purposely trying to irritate you or trying to offend the audience. Rather, true preachers are doing their best to faithfully expound God's word without compromising or even sugarcoating the text. Ultimately, it is God's word that could irritate and challenge and sometimes offend people because it tells them something that is against their cultural values and even their worldviews. Uh, that's why, all, that's why as, Peter, uh, as Paul said to Timothy, that all scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable for teaching, but not only teaching, but also rebuking and correcting and for training in righteousness. Additionally, true preachers are to faithfully expound God's word, preach God's word, because they don't want to offend God. You see, Steve Lawson, he once said that if you please God, it does not matter whom you displease. And if you displease him, it does not matter whom you please. I think that's very true. Ultimately, we want to strive to please God with everything that we do. And I think that's what the rest of Peter's sermon could sound like. It's going to be very challenging. He's going to challenge them, challenge the audience, the Jewish people there, regarding the person and work of Jesus. You see, remember the context. Peter just explained to them what was happening at the day of Pentecost and how this event could be a partial fulfillment or a pre-fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in verses, chapter 2, verses 14 to 21. But one of the main points of, in Joel's prophecy is that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved from the day of the Lord, or in other words, the day of judgment. But the question still remains, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? What is the name of the Lord by which people can be saved? And Peter here is going to preach about Jesus, the name above all names. And by preaching about Jesus, Peter is equating the name of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, which often signifies God's personal name, Yahweh, Peter is equating the name of Yahweh 
to Jesus. This would have been a very offensive message to the Jews to claim that Jesus is the name of the Lord, to claim that Jesus is Yahweh. This would have been a direct blasphemy. And the consequence could have been a capital punishment. Just remember, Peter's preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem where Jesus Christ was crucified. And he's very bold and he's very courageous in preaching about Christ to those whom, who crucified him, even if it may cost him his life. And so throughout the rest of the message in verses 22 to 30, 36, Peter is Christ-centered in his message. And so before the Jews, Peter is going to convince them that God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ. God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ. That is the main point of this message. But how? How did God authenticate Jesus as Lord and Christ? Well, follow along. Follow along your Bibles or from the projection as we consider this passage this morning. First, God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ through his miracles. That is what we see in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. See, Peter appeals to them about Jesus Christ through his miracles, like the mighty works and wonders and signs. Peter most likely talks about this first because this was a ministry and the work of Christ that would have been still fresh in their minds. Peter tells them at the end of verse 22, as you yourselves know, you've seen it, you saw it, you saw what Jesus Christ has done in your midst. They have witnessed the miracles of Jesus, but yet all at the same time, these same people refuse to believe in Christ because they were fueled with anger and hatred for him, for Christ. Even if you remember in the gospel, some, some of those same people allegedly accused Jesus of performing miracles by the power of Beelzebel, which is the prince of demons. But Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verses 24 to 25. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But hold on a minute. Why did, why did they hate Jesus and the father? Well, if you look back at the passage, it's because these miraculous works in Jesus' earthly ministry were accomplished by the Father through his Son. Miracles were actually mighty works of God. They were the power of God. Miracles were signs that authenticated the ministry of Jesus. Uh, and the purpose of miracles was not only to demonstrate God's power through his Son, but also to get people's attention and point them to the truth that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God. And so if they hated Jesus, then they have also hated the Father. And so Peter was driving home the point in this verse that Jesus Christ was not a false prophet, nor the false Messiah. He was not blaspheming for who he claimed to be. He was not doing miraculous work by demonic powers. He was who he claimed to be. He was the Lord in Christ. He was the Messiah. That's why he was able to do all these works. So God authenticated Jesus as Lord in Christ through his miracles. Second, God authenticated Jesus as Lord in Christ through his death. That's what we see in verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter then speaks about the event of Good Friday, the death of Christ, the cross of Christ, the, the atonement of Christ, the, the crucifixion of Christ. And now in the eyes of Jews, in the eyes of the Jews, the death of Jesus seems to be 
an event that invalidated his messianic claim. Even some of the Jesus' followers were hoping that he was the one who would redeem Israel, but they felt so hopeless when they saw him die. However, Peter is about to show them that the death of Jesus was not a mere accident, nor was it a tragic mistake, nor was he a victim of his enemies. The death of Jesus was all part of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The death of Jesus didn't invalidate his messianic claim. Now, there, when we look at this verse, there are some important terms that need to be clearly defined, like the definite plan and foreknowledge. Taken together, the phrase definite plan means that Jesus' death was ordained and planned by God from eternity past. It was God's predetermined will, his design, and his purpose. Even Isaiah 53 verse 10 very clearly says that it was the will of the Lord to crush him. For knowledge, I think this word is often a misunderstood word. Uh, we may define it as knowing an event before it happens. But however, uh, this word means far more than just knowing beforehand an event that will happen. You see, David G. Peterson, he once said this about this word, and I quote, God's foreknowledge, by the way, in the Greek, this word means prognosis, and that's where we get that word. God's foreknowledge means more than his ability to anticipate the future. It is another way of talking about his determination of events in advance according to his own plan, end quote. That's what God's foreknowledge means. He plans things in, in advance. And because the death of Jesus was the eternal plan of God, his death did not in any way invalidate nor contradict his claim, his messianic claim. Rather, it actually validated his claim because it was all part of God's plan. This is theologically and doctrinally critical for one reason. You see, after Adam and Eve sinned and the fall entered into the world, the cross of Christ was not a plan B. It was not like God just fumbled and just tried to find another way to redeem his people. It was not as if those Adam and Eve thwarted his purpose and plan. It was never a plan B. It was always plan A. A pastor once said that the plan of redemption was not a necessary afterthought to remedy a plan gone wrong. Jesus Christ had purposed to redeem us from eternity past. His work on the cross is nothing short of the pinnacle of the revelation of God's eternal and sovereign wisdom. So death of Jesus was all part of God's plan. However, although the cross was part of God's plan, God was not at all guilty of sin, but only those who crucified him. Hence, we see in this verse that Peter had the audacity to point his fingers to the Jews. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. In other words, ultimately, they're guilty of sin. They're guilty of killing Jesus Christ. And I believe this is also speaking to us too, because ultimately it's Jesus who bore our sin. It was our sin that put him on the cross. Even Peter is speaking to us to this day. And when you look at this verse, verse 23, this verse clearly holds two truths at the same time, the sovereignty of God and, the human, and human responsibility. So indeed, Peter held the Jews and even the Roman soldiers responsible and guilty for killing Jesus. They're known as the lawless men. But it's not exclusive to those two, but it includes the religious leaders, and even the government leaders like Pontius Pilate and Herod. But while all, the, all, all those are true, all at the same time, 
we must also recognize, even Peter recognizes that this was all part of God's plan, the plan of the triune God in initiating his work of redemption in eternity past. God authenticated Jesus as Lord in Christ through his death. Third, God authenticated Jesus as Lord in Christ through his resurrection. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be helped by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us this day, to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the, of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we, are, we all are witnesses. Now, unlike, the point, unlike, unlike point number one and point number two, Peter spends more time explaining the resurrection of Jesus Christ because I think this will be central to his message in explaining the day of Pentecost. Now, how was Jesus... How was Jesus able to be raised from the dead? Well, God, Peter attests to them that God raised Christ from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Speaking about the miracles of Jesus, the resurrection of Christ is probably the greatest miracle in history, the ultimate miracle in history. Uh, not merely because Jesus just died and rose, but there's something very unique about this because this proves the deity of Christ, that Jesus Christ it was indeed God and the, and the existence of God and even the fulfillment of all the prophecies. Jesus' death was like the pangs of death or the pains of death. Now the word pain here means great pain as in giving birth. Commentators said that, that the abyss can no more hold the Redeemer than a pregnant woman can hold a child in her body. In other words, Jesus' death was only temporary. It was only temporary and brief because God did a glorious act in raising his son from the dead. For what reason? It was because it was not possible. It was not possible for Christ to be held by the pangs of death. Death was powerless against our Lord and Savior because Jesus claimed that he is the resurrection and the life. And because his death has weakened the power of death and because God's divine purpose in raising his son cannot be thwarted, not even death itself. And to further establish Christ's credentials, to further establish Christ's credentials, and that it was God's glorious plan in raising him from the dead, Peter quotes from Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, a psalm written by King David. This is Peter's second reference to the Old Testament in this sermon. Remember, he quoted Joel, uh, the prophecy of Joel, and so now he quotes Psalms. Peter is essentially saying, here's the reason why it's important for you to know that God raised Jesus from the dead from the dead, and that it was impossible for him to be held by death. Here's the reason why, Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, speaks, generally speaks about confidence in the Lord's protection and defense. And knowing that is true, the psalmist can take comfort and joy and gladness, and he can trust his body, he can trust his flesh in God's care. But the verses that I want to draw your attention to is verses 27 to 28. Because Peter talks about it again in verse 31. Where David, not only as a king, but also as a prophet, 
He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So why Peter quotes from Psalm 16 is because he uses it to support his argument about the resurrection of Christ. Now, it is interesting that Peter says that, Jesus, that David was speaking about Jesus when it seems like in the original context that David was speaking about himself. However, Peter sees this psalm not as referring to David himself, but ultimately he understood this as David pointing to someone greater than him. Later on in Acts chapter 13, verse 35, the Apostle Paul uses this Old Testament reference again, Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, to explain Jesus' resurrection. See, Paul and Barnabas was on a missions trip to preach the gospel. And having spent a considerable amount of time explaining the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul says in this passage, therefore, he says, also in another psalm, you will not let your holy ones see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. And so interestingly enough, it may have been the church tradition to interpret Psalm 16, verse 10 as pointing to Christ being raised from the dead. And so in summary, in summary, what Peter's arguing about is that Psalm 16 is ultimately not about David. As he explains in verse 26, the reason being is that David died and was buried and his tomb still remained until this day. He is still dead. In other words, David didn't fulfill this passage of Psalm 16 because David is still in Hades, which generally means the place of the dead. David was still buried. And the Jews would know for certain during that time that David's tomb was undisturbed. Peter is telling them that David was pointing to one of his descendants, the son of David, the greater David, who will fulfill this psalm. And so to close off the section on the, on the resurrection of Christ, Peter tells them that this Jesus, God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I quote, the resurrection of our divine Lord from the dead is the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. End quote. And William Barclay would agree with Spurgeon, for he even said this, and I quote, Without the resurrection, there will have been no Christian church at all. End quote. Indeed, even the Apostle Paul says that if, the, if there was no resurrection, without resurrection, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The fact is, Christ did rise the dead. How can we know that? Well, first, God raised them up. Second, as we see here in verse 32, since the crowd should have known that Jesus was dead, Peter is telling them that he's not dead, but he is risen. It's kind of like the angel who said to the woman, he was not here, but he has risen. And he and the others are witnesses to this historical event, to the resurrection of Christ. Pay attention here. Peter is saying we all are witnesses. Remember that what this word means. This word witness in the Greek is martus, which is where we get our word martyred. It literally means to testify as a witness. And Jesus promised back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that the apostles and even subsequent followers of Jesus will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And certainly, they're witnesses to the resurrection of Christ because the risen Christ appeared to more than 500 people at one time. We have evidence, we have reasonable evidence to believe the, re the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Charles Spurgeon also said this, and I quote, The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is one of the best attested facts on record. There are so many witnesses to behold it that if we do, that we do in the least degree receive the credibility of men's testimonies, we cannot and we dare not doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. End quote. And indeed, witnesses underscore the reality of the resurrected Christ. And so, how did God make Jesus as Lord and Christ? Well, God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ through his resurrection. And finally, last point. God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ through his ascension. Take a look at verses 33 to 35. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter then circles back now. He circles back to the event of Pentecost and its phenomenon. Remember, the Jews were already wondering what happened and they needed an explanation. And the answer is the ascension of Jesus. The ascension of Jesus is the result of the resurrection of Jesus. And it was the ascension of Jesus, it was the ascension that vindicated Jesus of his earthly ministry. It was his exaltation, his place of honor and glory. And so the ascension links back to the work of Christ to Pentecost because Jesus received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And having seated at the right hand of God the Father, Christ poured out the Holy Spirit on this day. And this was evidenced by the miracle of the apostles speaking in foreign languages that the Jews themselves were seeing and hearing. Peter then quotes for the third time in his sermon, an Old Testament reference that proves that Jesus is Lord in Christ from his ascension. And this Old Testament verse is found in Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. And this would have been a very well-known verse, uh, psalm to the Jews. It is known as the royal psalm, the victory psalm. This is a critical piece of text that is repeated and quoted about 25 to 30 times in the New Testament. But this is a proof that Jesus Christ is the Messiah because of his ascension and exaltation. Now, when you look at the psalm, this psalm in the Hebrew, where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, you know, the first word for the Lord is Yahweh. The first word for Lord is Yahweh, which is God's covenant name. And it refers to the God of Israel. And the second word for Lord, my Lord, is Adonai, which could refer to master, our sovereign Lord. In the psalm, David says, my Lord, my Adonai. So he's speaking to an individual greater than David himself. And Yahweh is telling David, David's Adonai, to sit at his right hand until he makes his enemies a footstool for his feet. And this Adonai is referring to none other than Jesus who was raised from the dead and he was truly ascended at the right hand of God the Father and thus fulfilling Psalm 110. So God authenticated Jesus as Lord and Christ through his ascension here. And so Peter is slowly then wrapping up his message in verse 36 by saying, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter has preached a very mighty sermon explaining the event of Pentecost by pointing to Jesus as Lord in Christ because God has made him so. Now, and to even end it off in a bang, Peter then tells the house of Israel 
to know with certainty, to know with certain, for certain, meaning to know something beyond a doubt. He's hoping you know for certain that Jesus is indeed Lord in Christ. And he then again points his finger at the Jews that this same Jesus, whom God authenticated as Lord in Christ, through his miracles, through his death, resurrection, and ascension, he is the same Jesus whom they crucified. The Jews, they were in the wrong side of history. They are guilty of opposing the will of God and the plan of God by rejecting their Messiah. But this is not the end of Peter's sermon, per se. You see, no sermon should end unless the preacher appeals and calls the audience to respond to the good news so as to be saved, which is what we will cover next week. But know this, that this is a sermon that God used to save many souls from hell, from the wrath to come. And it is this sermon, what we, what we sometimes call it the home run sermon. This is that sermon. And it would have been interesting. It would have been very interesting if Peter live streamed his sermon or even recorded his sermon so that we can all watch and listen to it together. It would have been very interesting to hear what, was, what that was like. But of course, we don't have it. We only have the text. We only have the word. And so what can we learn about Peter's sermon? I, I want us to consider the day of Pentecost in relation to Peter's sermon. You see, it is so interesting that some Christians would put a lot of emphasis on the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, although I agree that he does play a significant role in the day of Pentecost. However, the, the Holy Spirit did not come at Pentecost so that he would be the focus. He is actually not the star of the show. Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit back in John. John 15 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you, speaking to the apostles, you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And in John 16, Jesus also said this, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He, notice this, he will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. You see, the day of Pentecost, the focus is not the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the focus. Jesus is, a, is the focus on the day of Pentecost as demonstrated in, in Peter's sermon. Peter was filled and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach a powerful sermon about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So I wonder, as we close things off and then transition to communion, I wonder, do you hear Peter's sermon speaking to you personally? And if you're not a believer this morning, know that Peter is talking to you. He's trying to convince you this morning that Jesus is indeed Lord and Christ, whom you crucified because of your sins that he bore. Are you convinced and even persuaded that Jesus is indeed your Lord and Savior and your Messiah? I hope you actually hear that you actually hear Peter's sermon the way the Jews heard it on that day and that they were convicted in their own heart. They were cut to the heart, as we will learn later on in the passage. And, that will, and, that, and, that, and it is a sermon that caused them to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. And I hope that you will do the same this morning, that you will give your life to Jesus. And brothers and sisters, do you hear how Peter 
presented Christ in his message. What can you take away from this example? You see, not all of you will preach, but you are still responsible in being a witness for Jesus' sake. And since you have the Holy Spirit living in you, will you continue to bear witness about Christ wherever you are? Take this time to think about it, consider this as we transition to communion. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for this morning, for this sermon that we all need to hear because it is the first Christian sermon in history. And it's a powerful sermon. And, and we are to consider just the impact it, can, it had on the Jews and even its impact in our lives. And how we are, as your, as your people, to continue to bear witness wherever we are at and to do so boldly, even if it, if it may cost us our reputation, even our lives. But, but Lord, I ask that uh, as, even as we have heard Peter's sermon, one of the things that we want to remember is the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And, we, and even as Peter's preached, this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord, we want to remember that it was our sins whom you, that you bore so that our sins can be forgiven, so that we can be reconciled to you. So Lord, help us to take this time, this moment, to reflect on this sacred meal that we're going to have late now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.